Good morning, Paul. Good Have morning, good Robert. How are you? First of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing at Alpha Cushion. So my background is in proprietary trading in Chicago starting in 1990. I was part of O'Connor and Associates, which uh, is one of the famous Chicago proprietary trading firms specializing in options that was born in the late 1970s and grew throughout the 80s. I joined as a fundamental research analyst in healthcare and biotech, very volatile stocks in 1990. And then Swiss Bank and UBS ultimately owned that franchise shortly thereafter, about 1993. I was also a co-founder of QuantLab, which went on to become a notable high-frequency trading firm. I was in the very early chapters, beginning chapters of that, which occurred primarily in the late 90s for me. And then, you know, was involved in some hedge fund development, the Ritchie family, Ritchie Capital in the early 2000s, and got to the point where I was more fascinated with technology and got into some consulting and some development in the latter half of the past 30 years or so that brings me to Alphacution. So I bring this proprietary trading perspective and a bit of a quantitative development perspective to Alphacution, which is a strategic advisory and research platform that I've developed starting in 2015. And it turns out that there's a lot of fascinating data lying around that can tell us amazing stories about some of the more secretive corners of the capital markets ecosystem. Primarily over the last couple of years, I have been modeling some of the most secretive and mythological players in the ecosystem, like Citadel Securities and Susquehanna International Group, Two Sigma, some of the Stadar players, Virtu Financial, which is somewhat less secretive because they're public, but have gotten into a lot of the proprietary trading firms what I call they stand in closest proximity to the sources of listed liquidity. So where we have connected, and I'll hand the baton back to you for to fill in some gaps, I have been modeling some of the areas that are close to these players, and it turns out the new 606, the Rule 606 report, the new format that came out for Q1 contained an amazing, an embarrassment of riches of data that tells some stories that I've been tracking for a while around payment for order flow and how some of these brokers, Robinhood, as well as TD Ameritrade and E-Trade, Schwab, and some others that I had never looked at before, how they're getting paid, at least in part. And so in modeling the data that's coming out of these reports, I wrote some stories recently about Robinhood that have attracted a lot of attention. And that brings us back to you and I having our reunion after a few years. I think it was 2014 last time we sat down together. So it brings us to this podcast, which I'm, I'm grateful to be part of. And so we, we need to build up the suspense and I'm glad you mentioned it. So we'll yeah. slowly build up to this. Anybody who listens, hopefully is along for the journey. So two old guys talking really boring equities and options trading in the US here. I'll give you very briefly my side of this story. So I joined Goldman in 2000, came to New York in 2002, which was just after the internet bubble burst, of course. I think Goldman still had just under 300 Nasdaq traders at the time. Then we moved back to Japan, came back to New York in 2008. And long and behold, at that time, there were about six Nasdaq traders left. Talking about all the deployment of AI these days or so, but the real transformation going from actual people trading to machines trading seems to have happened around 15 years ago. So please share some of your perspective on what you've seen in the noughties, the, the first part of the new millennium. I think there's a convergence of factors. Certainly, you have fragmentation of the liquidity. You have new exchanges. So that has to be one of the factors. And I think when you had Direct Edge and BATS come onto the scene, and some of the regional exchanges were not yet consolidated within the groups like ICE-NYSE and NASDAQ, 
and now CBOE in Chicago that are the three primary groups that own the U.S. listed exchanges. There are some exceptions like IEX, and there are some up-and-coming exceptions like Memex, which launches, I believe, first week of September this year. So go back to the noughties, you have fragmentation, you have a lot of new deployment of technology, latency, which is still a factor today, but it's much chunkier. You know, you go back a decade ago and you're talking about latencies measured in different increments, more like seconds and then milliseconds and then microseconds. And now latencies are measured in fragments of time that are smaller than microseconds. Meanwhile, you have, like in the case of QuantLab, we started out, there were several instances of that journey. We started out as a CTA, we were trading futures, and there wasn't enough diversification amongst the instruments available in futures. You had a few energy contracts and a few fixed income contracts. You had the S&P 500. You had a few others, but you really couldn't develop a basket that was diversified enough where you could create some internal hedging in that basket. And so while our back tests walked up the page, we had too many errors, too much slippage in the program. And so our live performance was the opposite of walking up the page. So we switched to stocks, which of course you had hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of different securities to choose from. We used options data to try and get a forward look at what the market was really anticipating about the underlying and developed a STAT-R program that had several hundred stocks in it. This is 1998, 1999. Mind you, some of the legendary firms like Renaissance and D.E. Shaw, uh, in the, certainly in the case of Renaissance, they're already ongoing figuring out their trading mechanism. D.E. Shaw is earlier days, and it isn't until about 2001 that Two Sigma is launched. So we were right there in the zeitgeist of the mid to late 90s, trying to figure out how to trade on an automated basis where high turnover was one to three days, one to three day turnover in the portfolio. It's primarily stat arb. You had a long side and a short side and some fundamental baskets. After I had left and moved from Houston back to Chicago to run research for the Richies and Richie Capital, QuantLab eventually figured out how to do its own execution, and that's what allowed it to speed up way past the one-day, one-to-three-day turnover and get away from what was at least originally a statistical arbitrage platform. So I tell you this story as some real you know, boots-on-the-ground examples of where we were at that time in terms of what was possible. And of course, you had a lot more technology being brought in and a lot more players trying out new technology. And you had a lot of liquidity and instruments that you could get to full workflow automation. In other words, you could get through the trade cycle without any human beings getting into the mix, that you could actually have a model that would determine a signal for a trade and fire that directly into the markets without any human beings being involved. This was really the first time you could do that right around 2000 to 2005. And you had a number of players that were fiercely competitive and trying to figure out how to capture what was a lot of very juicy alpha at that time. You mentioned fragmentation a few times already. And so while it was basically reduced the number of traders by 95%, at the same time, the volumes exploded and the execution size declined, which is a real characteristic of a truly fragmented market. And so it sounds very simple when we're saying we're trading cash equities, we're trading IBM stock, Amazon stock, and so on. But at this very point, you have 13 registered exchanges in the US. Yeah, now you do. 40, 50 alternative trading systems and then OTC brokers involved in the game. So that has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. And so it's this search for liquidity Again, you're part of that history. And then in this, why is something as simple as equity being so difficult, complicated in terms of the market structure? 
Yeah, this was really born out of some of the rulemaking of that time, Rag NMS, which is not something I have always been intimately involved in, but it was this rulemaking that allowed for this fragmentation, including the dark pools, which I think becomes a very significant factor in the story. Because if you own the dark pool and you can source liquidity from outside the dark pool, whether that's in the case of the sell side players, which you're more familiar with, that's your background, is if you have an embedded source of liquidity from your own asset management division that runs through your own dark pool, and you can run comparisons simultaneously with what is going on in the lit market, you get some advantages to take little pieces of spread or performance or alpha, whatever terminology you want to use, out of that trade before it gets into the lit market. And so today you see the leading players almost always, not in all cases, but in many of the cases, have their own dark pools where they're playing off of differences in price discovery for various securities, listed securities, now including options as well. And certainly another big factor is the ETF market explodes over the course of the last 10 years, representing a new product class with a lot of inefficiencies between the constituents of the ETFs and the ETFs themselves. That's another pet topic for me, the ETFs, because from a personal finance perspective, given that the Vanguard S&P 500 has an expense ratio of 0.03%, there's no better place to put your money if you want low-cost allocation of your portfolio. But then from a macro perspective, I think the academic research says that when you hit 30% or so of the total market cap held in ETFs, that you get inefficient markets again. And is that ultimately bad or is an inefficient market again an opportunity because it creates friction for the players in the market to generate alpha? One of the things that I've written about considerably and have incorporated when you think about my passion for the work that I'm doing now really comes down to being a puzzle solver and I'm looking for pieces to the puzzle. One of the themes that I've studied and written about and have modeled and provided some evidence for this hypothesis is the idea that the capacity of alpha, the capacity of outperformance, the amount of money that you can outperform with is finite. It's limited. By definition, you can't have unlimited outperformance is another way to think about it. This idea, it's elastic so that if there's more inventory, if there's more volatility, if there's more spread in the structure of the inventory in this market, then this idea of the theoretical capacity of alpha is elastic from any point in time. It can expand and contract depending on these factors. And the reason why I bring this up is what if you can capture this so-called theoretical alpha by standing close to the sources of liquidity? Because in a sense, that's where it emanates from. So if you're standing with your now industrialized technology that's very, very fast, and you're capturing inefficiencies between the products, not to mention some of the asymmetric inefficiencies that occur based on just asymmetric assimilation of data, right, of, of fundamental information, which is really the source of a lot of the alpha, interpreting the data flows better than the next player or differently than the next player, you can harvest this uh, performance. But if those who are standing close to the sources of liquidity are using their mechanism with speed, to capture these opportunities faster than the people that stand downfield. Think of it as a pit in Chicago. If you're on the next row behind, you may miss it. The opportunity may not flow further into the ecosystem. And this is a long-winded and maybe overly complicated way of saying that I believe this has fueled the drive towards the passive market where you have fewer players capable of capturing alpha and therefore certainly the retail players at scale have a harder time beating the market. So they say, well, I might, I might as well go into an ETF.
And this creates this massive barbelling of the strategy spectrum in the ecosystem, which, by the way, is relevant globally. This is not just a U.S. phenomenon. It just so happens that the U.S. is a big component of the global phenomenon. What is your perspective on the private markets playing, let's say, an ancillary role to that in a way that startups stay private longer? They're not entering the public markets. So, and I haven't looked at the data that comes just now out of the conversation, but I was thinking, yeah. relatively speaking, compared to 10, 20 years ago, the percentage that's actually on the public market of all the relevant companies should be lower now. There is this whole ecosystem of private equity, secondary trading of private equity that normally would have IPO'd long ago and would have maybe created more liquidity and, and certainly higher market cap for the public markets. Does that play a role at all? Interesting that you bring it up. It's definitely a factor and it's one that I'm watching as one of the newer factors. In other words, I haven't sought out the data other than indirectly looking at when you think of the capacity of alpha, you think one of the factors is the inventory. How many things do you have to trade potentially? The answer to that question has been shifting over the last several years as you have fewer individual companies going public. And then you have natural attrition through corporate actions, mergers, acquisitions, other reasons why you're leaving the market and consolidating the roster of individual companies. You have had some shift against that trend with the launch of new ETFs. So you do have new inventory, but it's a different kind of structured inventory that has some nuances that are both interesting and difficult. So you're masking the fact that the private markets have been sucking away a lot of the opportunities that would have been in the public markets. And I think that this is, in fact, a huge fact, one that we don't really understand well right now, and one that you could argue the regulators should have a closer handle on, and they don't seem to have a handle on that. They, there doesn't seem to be a referee that's going to come in and say, you know, in order for capitalism to work properly, we need to make sure that we have a sufficient number of companies in the public market. We can't have the private markets competing in this way, in this unfettered way. And I think you're on to something and it may, as we witness such transformation going on as we speak, still with technology, but now with incredible concentration risks, right? We have the top five companies in the U.S. markets are representing just under 25% of the capitalization of the entire market. I mean, it's an unprecedented level and it's a dangerous level where everybody's piled into the same name. And long has the valuation argument been thrown out the window. It's like, we don't care what the valuation is. We just all have to own some of these companies. I think that's part of the phenomenon as well that you see. Yeah, and you were saying is what can you actually trade? And then the secondary question is also what can you trade at size? And that brings you back to the five names, right? You've got this wall of cash, all the money being printed coming into the market. And so if you have a couple of billion to deploy, where do you put it but these five names? I have done a lot of modeling of the secretive and mis, you know, mysterious players, the Citadel Securities, as I mentioned, some of the option market makers in Chicago, Wolverine, CTC, Simplex Trading is, is a new one, and numerous others that a lot of folks have never heard about, but are very important to this structural component of the ecosystems that's very close to the sources of liquidity. But I've also to try and demonstrate the breadth of what my vision for Alphacution, that we aren't just about the secretive traders in New York and Chicago, and in some cases in, in London and elsewhere, Amsterdam, that if you go to the bigger names, the other end of the spectrum, like Fidelity, which is part of the story, I once modeled the 13F reports for Fidelity over their 25-year history of those reports. So it's a lot of data presented in a way that you don't normally see. Normally, the 13F is used to see what are your biggest holdings? What does Warren Buffett like the best? 
what Alphacution has done is use this data differently than anybody else, which is to look at the entire report over time and I talk about it in the sense of what is the shape of this strategy that they've been running now for five years or 10 years, or in the case of Fidelity, 25 years. And the point of this little anecdote is one of the analytics that you can dig out of this modeling technique that I've developed is concentration of capital to the top 10 names. And in the case of Fidelity, that analytic is higher than it's ever been in this 25-year history. It is similar to where the market is with their top five names commanding roughly 23, 24% of the market capitalization. I think the latest number for Fidelity for their top 10 positions was 23% of their total assets under management was in their top 10 names. So it just goes to show there's a number of implications of this. The first of which is obviously you have a major player that's becoming more concentrated, but it's also causing the entire ecosystem to become more concentrated. And it's a feedback loop. It tends to be self-reinforcing because the smaller players that may be wanting to buy value and sell growth, that they have a discretionary strategy where they're trying to find undiscovered names in the inventory. The fact that everybody's just piling into the same names means that some of these strategies that have worked in the past are no longer working in the current market environment. So one of the things that, that I've written about from time to time is you see a lot of hedge funds, they just say, look, we're getting out of the business. We, our strategy doesn't work, or we can't make money in this market, or we can't justify our fees in this market. So you see so many knock-on effects from some of these factors converging. Very interesting, like you mentioned, the 13 Fs. It brings us a bit to the secret sauce, what we're doing at the heart of it. And ultimately, the secret sauce is you, because what you're dealing with is a commodity. It's public information. Anybody can access the information that you have. You combine it with other sources and your industry experience to derive the insights that you're deriving. I mean, in, in a way, it's like an equity analyst looking at quarterly reports and putting their perspective in there. On the one side, it's not rocket science. On the other hand, it's incredibly fascinating because we're now getting to the rule 606 and what it means and how it changed. And you really derived insights from this data that we need to explain that came out new that nobody else had figured out. It's classic case of the difference between data and information or insights. And you took that data and really generated knowledge that was new. It fascinates even me, the idea that there's all this data lying around for free. I mean, you have to figure out how to find it, but I'm not buying anybody's data in order to harvest this intelligence. I'm just downloading or picking it up in files off of websites. Some of them are company websites. A lot of it is regulatory data that's mandatory that gets filed every so often. There's two things, two factors, and this is from my perspective, and I'm biased to the perspective because it's me. The first is that we are in a period of intense interest in gadgets, machine learning, artificial intelligence the buzzwords of the day, blockchain, a high automation, natural language processing, rapid process automation, all these gadgets and toys and buzzwords. And you have a lot more of the human capital in the space that is coming with academic backgrounds in computer science and physics and math and, and now new quantitative financial engineering programs that have been developed specifically to develop skill sets to thrive in this environment, which by default makes someone like me more and more of a dinosaur. Most of my peers have retired from the prop world that were there in the late 80s and 90s and you know some of them earlier than that, but some of them really caught their wave in the 80s and the 90s. Certainly the heyday of high frequency trading in the noughties and a lot of these players have gotten wealthy, wealthy, they're sitting atop successful organizations, they're either running those organizations or they're headed to the beach. There's not someone like myself who's sitting around that has had this kind of experience over 30 years 
in some of the rare corners of the early days of highly automated trading development, having met Jim Simons and met Stevie Cohen and met some of the hedge fund luminaries when I was developing QuantLab and other projects with my partners there, there's just not many folks around that have the insight that I have. And then the part of me that may be unique is just I have the patience and the tenacity to solve these really hairy puzzles. Some of the spreadsheets that I've built are maddening that other people wouldn't want to build. But it turns out it's been an opportunity. Sounds really geeky, these spreadsheets. The second part is also the storytelling making the complex data and this humongous spreadsheets that you're building into, distill it into something that is easily understandable. And I reread your four pieces on Robin Hood this afternoon before we got on this. First of all, the style is cracking me up. I probably haven't laughed that hard in, in a long time <laughs> since the last time I read your articles. And it really boils it down to the essence of what is probably like these huge gigabyte size spreadsheets that you're looking at. The thread that ties my career together from the first minute I found myself on the trading floor at O'Connor was the fascination with the data. And even since I was a kid, just solving puzzles figuring out how things work and having the patience and the focus to figure out how these pieces fit together. We live in a tension economy. There's more content providers than ever before. The barriers to entry to set up a website or a blog and put your thoughts down has never been easier nor cheaper at least the possibility of accessing networks and communities across the entire world, the possibility of that is never greater than before. But the flip side of that is there's a lot of noise. And so we're all competing, screaming, trying to figure out how to capture someone's attention. I know that I can't be successful economically as a business if I don't figure out how to capture that attention. While the style that I've developed in writing back half of my career as a consultant, as a research analyst, working for other platforms, and then over the past five years under the Alphacution banner, is I have to grab your attention. There has to be pictures, titles have to be engaging. This is classic journalism, which I'm not classically trained in, but you have to learn how to grab people's attention And you learn through experimentation, for instance, if you put Citadel in the title, or even you know, more relevant to what we're talking about here, if you put Robin Hood in the title, it turns out that that's a very compelling thing for people to learn something about. It's a hot topic. The brand development that I've done, people know that I'm likely to have something different to say about Robin Hood because I insist on putting 99% of what I put out there on our feed, I insist on having a chart in there. I'm not going to compete with opinion writers that are just going to riff on their thoughts for a thousand words and not include a chart. It has to be based on some kind of data. That's the thing that I think is missing in a lot of my peers in research and advisory work is they're not objectively trying to wrestle with the data. They have their surveys, which is a subjectivity issue. I'm dealing with an objectivity issue. I'm actually looking for data from a trusted source, whether the company or a regulator, and trying to come up with a picture that says, here's the pattern that explains the strategy. It turns out that people that have been reading for a while have learned to trust that I'm going to drag something out that hasn't been dragged out by many of my peers. I'm not saying I'm the only one. There's some, some folks at Bloomberg do a good job. Some folks elsewhere do a good job. I'm not the only one doing a good job, but certainly I pride myself in having a unique angle and usually in a way that might get a chuckle out of you too. Yeah, and so what do they say? If you don't have data, you're just another guy with an opinion. And also, we shouldn't leave the pitch until the very end. So while you're putting out quite a bit of high-quality content for free, you also have a subscription for your service for even deeper insights. People can subscribe to that. 
this is definitely an economic venture. You know, I'm here to grow a platform. In some ways, I'm building a data set or a series of data sets. I'm organizing certainly the 13F data in a way that I don't believe anybody else has ever done before. I'm adding other data sets, certainly the new 606 format and others, 605, are going to become important. You get a lot of data from the exchanges in terms of volumes and other analytics, the constituencies of that volume. So I'm gradually assembling, you know, a knowledge base that then the next layer from there is essentially a chart library that shows the curves and the shapes and the pictures. And then what I do that's unique is the storytelling on top of that. Now, the way I've been able to monetize this work so far, which has gotten really exciting, there's a premium level of content where I've done deep dive, comprehensive case studies on these so-called mythological and secretive players in the ecosystem. It started by studying the spending patterns, the technology-specific spending patterns in the asset management ecosystem, and I discovered some patterns whereby the spending patterns on technology is highly correlated to the underlying strategy being deployed when you normalize that spending by headcount. So I developed some analytics, TCO per employee, for instance. Not to get into too much detail on that, there's an executive summary on our, on our website that you can find. This started the map, the so-called map of the ecosystem, based on this and other analytics, was the first case study called the context machine. And that's what really got me focusing on the secretive market makers that are in what I call the structural alpha zone. And it's not a US phenomenon, it's true all over the world. There are market makers, and proprietary players. Some of them are banks. Some of them are units of banks that are standing close to the sources of liquidity in Japan and Hong Kong and Sydney and elsewhere, everywhere. But what turns out is many of these players over the world are the same ones. And I've mentioned now a couple of times Citadel, they've got units all over the world trading in all the major market centers. So after the context machine, I did a case study on Citadel Securities, and that really caused a lot of buzz because nobody had ever seen such a thing. How can you take free data that's lying around and generate 60 charts on Citadel? Nobody had ever seen that. And so subsequently, I did one on Susquehanna, and then I did one on Two Sigma, focusing in on Two Sigma Securities. The latest one I've done on Jane Street has been a huge hit. That is 125 pages, which embarrassingly, I didn't really want it to be that long. I just had so much data that I needed to work through. That ended up being 125 pages, nearly 150 charts. Amazing. What has happened is the prop shops have never purchased research because they don't look outside their firm. They never look at consultants or rarely will they ever look at consultant outside because everything they do is proprietary. But they've realized is they may not know their competition as well as they should. And as a result, many of the top trading firms in the world have become clients of Alphacution so that they can access these case studies and learn something new about their competition or maybe about themselves just understanding what can be known about us from the public domain. And this has created such a fascinating phenomenon that the people, the top people in the world, the CEOs and the founders of most of the top trading firms in the world have been reading Alphacution and buying these case studies, which is, has been a fascinating journey for me to, to be in touch with some of the luminaries of the royalty of trading across the world. That's been a kick. I can imagine, totally. On the one side, we've got these secretive firms that you mentioned, and then over by now almost 50 years, the retail brokerage landscape in the U.S. has obviously changed fundamentally. I think Schwab was founded in 1974 or so as the first discount broker. So we got at some point $10 trades and got $5 trades. 2014, Robin Hood came on the scene and you got zero commission trading. The rest of the industry gave in at the end of last year where the likes of Schwab, etc. also gave the clients zero 
commission trading for U.S. equities and options. The cliche, of course, is if something's free, then you are the product. Ultimately, Robinhood is valued at something like $8.2 billion, as you also reported. You figured out with that 606 data how possibly get to such a valuation even in these extreme times. So let's explain first the change in reporting that took place at the beginning of the year that led to the availability of the data that you're working with. Yeah, so the major change, and I'll keep it as simple as possible, is prior to this year, prior to the March It's a quarterly report, and prior to the March issue, the March 2020, for many firms, that's the Q1 report, but for others like TD Ameritrade, I think they're October fiscal, but they still are reporting differently. Prior to that, in 2019 and before, you just had to share the percentage of orders directed to different brokers. And there are four different order types You had to show the percentage of each order type sent to your list of counterparties among the brokers. So it was useful just to kind of get a ranking of where certain flows tend to be going. But the major change that really blew up this report in terms of its importance and in terms of what it can illuminate they've added the net cost or the payment for order flow, but some of it is not payment for order flow, but they've included in the new format, the economics that go along with the percentages. So for instance, I sent 35% of my market orders to this venue, whether it be a market maker and their dark pool, or even to an exchange, NASDAQ or others. Not only is the percentage there, but the aggregate amount of the cost of directing that flow and the implied rate per 100 shares and or option contract for directing that flow. So we're getting a lot more granular data associated with this relationship over and above the percentage directed to that venue or to that broker. Now, the practical implication of that is why that is important is and it might be coming as a surprise to some of the Robin Hood users even, is that when you do an order on Robin Hood, it's not like it goes to the New York Stock Exchange directly. So they have discretion where they put it and they sell this order flow to the secretive players that we alluded to. So they might sell their order flow to a company like Citadel for example. That's exactly right. The way that you get to zero commissions is there's some other economic somewhere else that is not quite as obvious. And in this, in the case of Robinhood, they have been a leader in executing on this business model that says, well, you can trade for free. We're going to get paid elsewhere. And the elsewhere is players that essentially bid for this order flow. And really because it's retail order flow, flow where the sensitivity to the quality of execution is typically not as high as what you find in professional domains with institutional traders and institutional money managers. My own son has a Robinhood account. He's trading Tesla for a 10-point move. He doesn't really care if he gets filled a penny here or a penny there. And those pennies are what the market makers like Citadel Securities, Virtu, and others are harvesting from this order flow and turning it into millions and millions of dollars of revenue for themselves. So this type of order flow is very valuable. And Robinhood, given the background of its founders, knows this going in. They know this before they even put it, they started with a blank canvas and they knew it going in. That if they could design a frictionless environment where people will trade perhaps more than they should, that the order flow that comes off the back of that kind of mechanism that's frictionless and what I call highly gamified, It's like a video game that human nature will take over and people will trade more actively like a social media platform would cause you to do to generate flows that are very, very valuable to members of the ecosystem. 
So as of the first quarter of 2020, Robinhood generated about $90 million in revenue based on payment for order flow. Now the question is, do you get to an $8.6 billion valuation based on 90 million in revenue for the first quarter? I think that's a stretch. Even if you continue to increase your payment for order flow for subsequent quarters, and my estimate for the second quarter, I think is 130 million, 140 million. So they're growing quite rapidly. Even if you came up with very aggressive estimates for payment for order flow in 2020, you'd still have a hard time getting to 8.6 billion. You're still applying a very, very high multiple to the revenue. And I don't think payment for order flow in US listed products is their only source of revenue. I actually, and we'll make some news here potentially, there may be a payment for order flow version being developed in the crypto market, which would be outside any regulation. The regulation hasn't caught up to the fact that you would do such a thing. But there are some of these players, that the market makers that have become active in cryptocurrency trading that have already harvested significant profits out of the global crypto market that leads me to believe that why wouldn't they buy order flow from the likes of Robinhood in the crypto market, which has no Rule 606 requirement. It's so clear when you say it. That's again, kind of the way you tell the story. For instance, let me, just one more point. At $8.6 billion, even if you applied a really aggressive 10 times multiple to revenue, that's $860 million. Robinhood is not making $860 million in payment for order flow in 2020 for U.S. listed products, including options. Maybe they get to four or $500 million, and maybe you could argue that the multiple is higher than 10, which just seems insane. I mean, 10 is insane. And especially now that they look like they're closing down indefinitely their European expansion, their UK expansion, you couldn't argue necessarily that they're going to pick up another 10 million accounts in the non-US market. So this growth has got to be based on a more US-centric view of accounts. And I'm just having a hard time figuring out where the other revenue lines are to get you to somewhere even close to a billion dollars in revenue for 2020. It just seems, well, I mean, there are lots of things going on in the world that are insane right now. So maybe it's par, par for the course. But let's also put the 90 million for the first quarter into perspective because you did that comparison versus Swap and the other players. So it's not an insignificant amount at all. They're second only to TD Ameritrade. Let's put it that way. They're bigger than Schwab. Robinhood is more aggressive in the use of payment for order flow, which in the last piece that I wrote that really went viral, it's the non-marketable limit orders and options that they're making 45%, I think the number was, for almost half of their payment for order flow is coming from this one bucket, which is the stop loss orders Essentially, the stop loss limit order applied in option. They're making a boatload of money in that category. When you add up all the categories and you get to 90 million for Q1, you're already bigger than Schwab. You're already bigger than E-Trade. And depending on how you handle TD Ameritrade, which is really two entities, there's TD Clearing and TD Regular, I suppose. And they're both about 100 million in payment for order flow for Q1 which means that Robinhood is almost as big as both of those. But when you add them together, TD is still 200 and some odd million, over 200 million for Q1. And already we know that TD was 340 million in payment for order flow for Q2 because they reported it in their, they're a public company. So even though their 606 isn't out, they reported their earnings and their earnings statement has this data in it. Now, you also did some comparison between the 606 and the quarterly earnings statement, and they didn't quite tie up for all the players. That's right. That's good. They didn't add up for anybody. You have a couple of cases. Well, you have the TD case where I have identified a little over $200 million for Q1, but TD reported 220. So there's about a $20 million, about an $18 million discrepancy 
This may come out in the wash. Sometimes a little birdie will send me a, an email from deep inside some company or ha someone who has a unique perspective and say, hey, you should look over here or you're, you're missing this player. We do have the network effect that helps us. I only found a little over 50 million that Virtu paid in Q1, but they reported paying 62 million. So I'm missing 12 million in payments that Virtu made during Q1. And they're the one circumstance, the one example on the market maker side that's public. They're fascinating to watch, but there's some discrepancies in their numbers that I haven't identified. I'm not saying that their discrepancies are on purpose. I just haven't found them. Eventually, I think we'll find them. But I thought it was an interesting note to make that there are competing sources of data for this information that don't yet line up. And I think that's an interesting piece of the puzzle. I want to go back to some of the fundamental education because you talked about the most valuable order type being this non-marketable limit order. So yeah. not all order types are created equal. The way that reporting works, you've got three different product categories, if I understand it correctly. You've got the S&P 500, the non-S&P 500, and the options, and you've True. got four order types on the other side. And right. so options are more valuable than the equities, and then within the order type, certain order types, and especially this NMLO is particularly valuable to these misty players. Can we demystify that once more? It comes down to the way the rules operate. If we go through the four types, the market orders have rules such that you got to be at the market. So there's less discrepancy between the liquidity venues on whether there's a good arbitrage there. It may also be that just fewer of the orders are of that type, which I think is definitely true of the fourth bucket, which is basically the kitchen sink. It's all other. I don't think that there's many orders that are falling into that last bucket. And so therefore you don't see the economics. The economics of that bucket are the lowest of the four. When you isolate the marketable limit orders and the non-marketable limit orders, those are the two most lucrative buckets when it comes to the payment for order flow. And I believe that the reason is, is the way the rules work is you have more discrepancy to trade a dark price versus a limit price as opposed to just the lit, you know, people talk about the NBBO, the national best bid and offer. And I believe that there are some loopholes in the rule or some nuances in the rule that if you can trade in the dark, you don't have to play by the NBBO rules, which creates some fleeting arbitrage that the leading high performance, high turnover prop firms and market makers can use to harvest some edge between their internal modeling and this kind of flow, which has more flex in it. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. It comes back also to what you said earlier that the folks who set up Robin Hood knew exactly what they are doing. They have been gunning for this outcome from the beginning. And I think that this is, you know, the power of the design. It's not only the design of the business model, which creates the frictionless component. It preys on human nature. Hey, if it doesn't cost me anything, if I have an unlimited tub of ice cream, then therefore I can eat as much ice cream as I can possibly eat, which human nature will tend to do if there's nothing to stop you, if there's no friction. Commissions are a form of commission where you have to think about, okay, I can't just trade infinitely because I'll eventually eat up all my money in transaction costs. Well, if I don't have that impediment, then my calculus about the trading is much, much different. I can do it as much as I want, which creates an environment that may not result in the best outcome for the trader. Certainly, you're going to have stories where one out of a thousand or one out of a million makes a fortune trading options on Robinhood. But for the vast majority of people, they're just not going to be able to enjoy that kind of success. In fact, maybe more so to the contrary, they will have the opposite experience. So when you take the frictionless environment and you apply design that's intentional, 
And we know of lots of other Silicon Valley platforms that are specifically a design to grab your attention and make you do certain things or at least make it really hard for you to leave. That type of design sensibility has been embedded in this Robinhood platform on purpose. Maybe the last question is the outlook into the crystal ball and what will the future bring for market structure in the U.S.? It's like the Mark Twain quote, you know, if, if I had had the time, I would have written a shorter note. Answering that question is complicated because I believe that the landscape will remain complicated. We have new liquidity pools in listed products coming out in the fall, as, as I said, with Memex. That is additional complexity, which is an indicator that the powers that be seem to be satisfied to continue to promote complexity in market structure. That complexity continues to favor a certain type of incumbency. When you add the resiliency of that incumbency to the idea that technology has a tendency to create winner-take-all dynamics in markets, that one of the worrisome factors in our markets today, which is concentration of the players, will continue. I've called this an incumbency of incumbents, that the powerful players will continue to remain powerful and they will continue to harvest market share, which in some ways is a greater share of a limited capacity of alpha. That means that you'll have more second tier maybe even top tier hedge funds hanging up their collective hats. If the founder is already wealthy and maybe getting on in age, maybe they go hit the beach and say, screw it, this is too hard, or it's not worth all the hassle to try and deal with investors and earn fees and try and harvest performance out of a market that is not only increasingly concentrated, but it's also increasingly dominated by the central bank, which is also extremely worrisome. We are in uncharted waters, my man. We are in a strange world. And while there will be volatility, which means that there will be opportunities to gamble on big moves, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to the point of maybe even being impossible or increasingly impossible to scale a business, to scale an institutional trading business in this market if you're just getting started. There will be some exceptions. There's a group, XTX, based in London. They've made amazing inroads in the FX markets as a high-frequency trading firm in FX. They're beginning to apply their technology and their approach in other instruments. So they're an example of a prop shop that is beating the odds. But for the most part, many of these trading firms, secondary level prop firms, uh, you know, small to medium size prop firms, they will have challenges. New hedge funds are going to have challenges. As more and more of this so-called capacity of alpha is being harvested by industrialized technology mechanisms that are owned by the biggest, smartest players in the world. And so I worry that this incumbency of incumbents will persist, which creates concentration in markets including the Black Rocks in the passive world, they will continue to gather more assets to the point where it's going to be hard to be a smaller shop in the trading world. And more and more of these, you know, the big players will get bigger and the smaller players will have a tough time. And maybe that's why if you're a retail gambler, it may be fun, but it's going to be dangerous too. I'll say one more thing, a, a term that I've been using that is maybe not well known is while so many of my peers and respected peers at that tend to focus on something called market microstructure, you know, the little nuances of the rules and the matching engine and so forth, I'm looking the other way in this green pasture called market macrostructure. What is the macrostructure of the market? What is the field on which all these strange and secretive and mythological players play? 
And that has turned out to be a really fascinating seat to sit in with a lot of fascinating stories that very few have been able to tell. So I'm grateful to be able to see you on the screen from across the world and have this kind of conversation. I hope it's the first of many. Wonderful. Well, I think it was fascinating to catch up and fascinating to hear your insights and how you developed all of this. So thanks very much for the conversation, Paul. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.